Shalom and welcome everyone to a, another episode of a Jew and Gentile Discuss. This is episode, if I'm not mistaken, number 30. We've hit the 3-0 mark today, me and Brother Mitch. I, I am your host, Tony Pino, and like I said, my co-host here is Brother Mitch Chapman. And uh, we're pretty excited about this episode because it is the episode right before Pesach, <clears throat> before Passover. And uh, there's just so much to talk about in this episode concerning the Passover. We definitely want to, and we have been talking in the past couple episodes about Passover. So uh, this is kind of the high point or the crescendo of uh, what we want to share with you on Passover. I mean, let's face it. It's the uh, initiation of the new covenant, right? It's, it's now Yeshua saying, do this in remembrance of me. And he, you know, being deity, he being the son of the father who came and did the will of the father. Uh, it's, it's what, you know, it's the greatest place to begin with, with obviously we're at the beginning of the biblical calendar. We're in that first month. It's the first Moedim, you know, of the biblical year here and how we follow the, uh, Moedim. And so, uh, it's, it's exciting. It's kicking it off. And, uh, we, you know, obviously Yeshua is the high point. He is what everything, uh, that we do want to point to right his work his resurrection and so forth so we're pretty excited about this episode and we uh you know definitely just want to dive into it today it's uh i've had opportunities this week to share with people for the first time who are trying to figure out you know how easter came in as a tradition is it pagan and you know so i'm just pointing them to pesach i'm pointing them to let's get to the first century let's talk about what they did please show me you know, uh, these traditions that you're following in the Bible. And of course they can't, right? Because they come much, much later. And so I'm saying, let's just stick to the Bible. You know, if, if we're going to be Bible uh, following believers in Yeshua, stick to the Bible. So understand the culture, understand how things are done. And nowhere in the first century that they stopped doing Passover. Nowhere. All right. They brought it in. And when he said, do this in memory of me, that's exactly what they kept on following to do. And so Brother Mitch is going to help us uh, begin to walk through the process of what covenants are and so forth, di directly connecting this to the Seder meal. So Brother Mitch, how are you doing today? Uh, it's been an interesting couple of days again, but uh, things, things are well. Um, and, and thanks for asking, Tony. It's always uh, a joy when we are able to uh, get together and uh, do these uh, discussion. Uh, I know that you and I, after we're done, we always talk about, you know, how did this one go? And, um, you know, we just enjoy this time of fellowship and sharing the word and interacting with one another. And we really pray, I mean, we, we don't have egos, but uh, we, we're just prayerful that in some fashion that our discussions over the course of time are able to help people to grow in the grace and knowledge of uh, Adonai Yeshua HaMashiach, Amen. our Lord uh, Yeshua, the Messiah. And, uh, you know, if, if we, if, if something that we have said, uh, you know, pricked you, helped you in, in some fashion, Baruch Hashem, you know, that, that's really what it's all about. Uh, Tony's heart is the same as my heart is. It's discipling, it's teaching, it's helping brothers and sisters mature in the faith. Uh, not that we have matured, but we are maturing, but we've walked um, a long distance, been through a lot of different uh, things in our lives, and because of what we've gone through, not just personally, we come to a position that we can provide biblical counsel uh, in addition to uh, just biblical knowledge. And that, that's very important. Um, so uh, what, what we're gonna do uh, during this session is we're gonna talk about an aspect of Pesach or Passover. <clears throat> that's really uh, hardly ever, if at all, talked about. 
Now, when I started my series of Sunday Night Live uh, sometime, um, I think it was February of last year, um, I started to walk through uh, the, the four cups and what they represent and where they all lead to. And the four cups, here's the short course of it. Each cup on the Seder table, I'm talking about the four main, I'm not talking about Elijah's cup for the moment, because now we can say there's five. If you come from a reformed Jewish background, you're gonna say that there's six. So I, I get all of that, okay? It's not what I'm talking to. I'm talking about the four main cups, and yeah, I know there's some wise guy out there or some wise woman out there who's going to say, well, show me where there's four cups in the Bible. I, I only see two in one gospel. I only see one in one gospel. Fair enough. So my response to that is, do you think that everything is in the Bible that it has occurred throughout history or what is in the Bible is only or what we need to know specifically about something that occurred. Different perspective. Now, then you say, well, how come there's two and not there? And, and, and one other says there's one. Well, let me ask you this. I don't know if you're a sports fan or not, but let's take Super Bowl. Uh, let's take the, uh, the NCAA men's basketball championship, but we could go Monday. How many reporters were there covering the game? 50, 25? Were there more than one? The answer is yes. Do you think that every one of those sports reporters or any reporter that's covering an event, especially the infamous January 6th, which isn't what is being reported as occurred, okay, non-political announcement. Just a fact. Does every reporter report the exact same thing? And the answer is no. Why? Because we all have our own set of two eyes and we all have our own set of two ears. So we're going to hear, although we're seeing the same thing and we're hearing the same sounds, we're going to process it differently because that's how we're made. And that is, in essence, a very short reason why there's something called the synoptic gospel. Now, that's a very oversimplistic explanation, but I believe it makes the point. So with the Seder, again, there's the four main cups is each one of the cups represents a milestone, represents an actual uh, landmark in our relationship with Yeshua. But more importantly, where do these four cups end up? I'm not talking about the wine that ends up in our stomach or the juice that ends up in our stomach or the stuff that we throw away. No, I'm talking about where do these individual cups lead to? And then when you take a step back from that, and now you look at it from a completely different perspective, you say, I never saw that. I never heard that before. I never knew that before. First things first, that doesn't make me the smartest the greatest, the most intelligent Bible teacher or anybody that you've ever heard from before. I'm the first guy at the head of the line that says, absolutely not. Because I know <laughs> I'm not the smartest. I know that I'm really slow. And my IQ is uh, has a lot of work to do. It always had. But there's some things that I see and I just grab it and I want to just follow it through. And that's how I was wired. So there's a lot of different ways to refer to the four cups. And everyone would uh, say that the first cup is the cup of sanctification. 
people would say the second cup is the cup of blessing. Most people are in agreement that the third cup is the cup of redemption. And then uh, the fourth cup, people would call it different things. They would call it the cup of praise. Um, referring to Elijah's cup, pretty much uh, that's what they call it. What I like to do is a method of teaching that I've used for many, many years called alliteration. And alliteration is something really no more than uh, having words either starting or ending or having the same sounds or letters in them or some form of pronunciation that just are continuing through so that it's easier to remember. And this was something that I learned many, many years ago in the first church that I was planted in. And then I kind of uh, got a, uh, perfected by the second church that I was planted in. Uh, and what I would do in the third church was I would hear uh, the pastor preaching and there, there was no alliteration to it, just a whole bunch of points. And what I would do is I would sit there or either, you know, on the way uh, after we're home going through the notes again, what I would do is I would put them, I would always try to put the pieces of the puzzle of the notes in a form that they would be in alliteration so that if I was going to provide this Bible study at a later point, and many times I have, then I could bring it in a way that would be perhaps a little clearer. So here's my version of the five cups, and I'm including Elijah's cup for the moment. So we have the first cup is sanctification. We have the second cup is condemnation because it relates to the plagues you can see the connection the third cup is the cup of redemption the fourth cup is the cup of exaltation because it's a cup of praise and the fifth cup would be the cup of anticipation because it's elijah's cup and we're waiting for elijah to return so i i think you can see the connection as to how sanctification condemnation redemption or salvation salvation is probably an easier one to remember exaltation and anticipation and again all that that's doing is lifting out lifting up a thought and then trying to massage them all together so that they can be presented in a way that might be easier through a sound, through a pronunciation, through uh, the be a beginning letter, an ending letter, something like that to help everybody remember. So those are my five cups. Now, but what do these four cups really represent? What, are they, what do they really do? Where are we going with this? Come on, Mitch, hurry up and get on with it. You're boring me. Yeah, I know. It's okay. So what do we know is going to happen sometime down the corridor of time when Yeshua returns? What's it called? It's in the book of Revelation. It's called what? The marriage supper of the Lamb. But what is this marriage supper of the lamb that's being referred to? Well, I can tell you, it's not going to be a ham feast. <laughs> there's no Easter ham, right, on the table. Uh, there, there's no ham, <laughs> except the funny jokes that somebody's trying to become one. Um, <laughs> other than that, no. Um, but that is, in fact, another Passover. A future Pesach. But it's the marriage supper of the Lamb when everything comes together. Because from the beginning of Genesis through the end of the Bible in Revelation, all 66 books, the common thread, the common theme is all about God's love for his people. And what better way to end a inspired 66 books of the Bible? with a wedding, demonstrating physical, formal love. That's it. Right. 
So that's where these four cups lead up to. Now, uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to go back into the, I won't do it today because it will be extremely lengthy, but I'm going to go back to the series that I taught through very deeply each individual step. And I'm going to, I'll probably do it again, starting uh, a week from Sunday. <clears throat> but what I'll also probably do is go back to what I've already uh, done and then try to, uh, you know, tie them in so that here, if somebody wanted to go deeper, they don't have to wait down the road. They can, I can refer them back to uh, a Sunday night live episode. And then they can get more information about the first cup, second cup, third cup, and fourth, and so forth and so on. So, but let's remember that what we're, this is covenant. This is not a testament. It's covenant. We've been walking through the, the book of Hebrews. We've talked about covenant often. And where do we, and you, you're not going to find testament in the Bible, except if it's italicized. And then the two or three places where it's not italicized, when you're looking at it in its context, you realize it's not a testament. It's, it's, it's all about covenant. So this idea of a new covenant is something that's not new. It's very old. <laughs> And it's in Jeremiah, of course, chapter 31, when he says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them. But this will be the covenant that I will make with the house of Judah. And then he goes on and he says, and I will place it in their mind and upon their hearts. And then he closes out the thought by saying that, and in that day, no more, um, well, everyone will know God, okay? So that, that is predominantly why my ethnic Jewish people will say, no, there's no such thing as a new covenant. Okay, you, you can believe that, but uh, you're, you happen to be wrong. So let's, let's go back and uh, let's start to delve into the very, um, I, I don't want to go uh, very deep because it could be here forever and um, want to get through some things. But basically that when we, when we think in terms of the four different covenant types. And I'm talking about the patriarchal covenants, which is, this is where the concept of how these four cups are all the mile markers of a marriage ceremony. And sadly, patriarchal covenant is something that's not taught. And so, we have to understand that covenant is progressive in nature, meaning that you must enter into uh, one. And then when you get to the first, if you choose to proceed, you don't lose the first covenant. The first is already there. The first will stay there, but you're building upon the first and you're adding to it. And the same thing when you enter into the second, if you did that, and choose now to go into the third. You don't lose the first. You don't lose the second. You add to what you already have with the third. And the same thing, should you or anyone determine that they want to become part of the bride. And sadly, not all believers in the biblical Yeshua will be part of the bride. And just like salvation is a choice that we make while we're still breathing, becoming a part of the bride 
is a choice that we make while we're still breathing. I know that's difficult for many people to hear because it's not what's taught. And I understand that. And it's a very rude awakening for many, many people. Well, let me put it to you this way, uh, is that all believers will be at the wedding. But at the wedding, there's two sets of people. There's the guests and there's the brides. And you can't be both. The only way you get to become part of the corporate bride is by entering deeper into relationship with Yeshua, our bridegroom or prospective bridegroom. But we do that by taking our relationship with him deeper and each step of the Pesach Seder represented by the four cups of wine adds additional depth to the relationship that is started when we first enter into covenant with him, which is the first cup of wine. It's actually referred to as what? The cup of sanctification. Now, forget about what I just said, but what does sanctification mean? Set apart. What were we set apart from? We've been set apart from the world. Right? Okay. So, so Brother Mitch, that, is that the reason why um, they do, a, you know, Obviously, they do a cup um, on Shabbat and so forth. They do the, the Kiddush cup. Uh, is that for sanctification, for setting yourself apart? Is that all connected? Well, it's sanctification. Uh, not it, A lot of people would take a look at uh, what happens on Shabbat with the blessing of the, the wine or the juice, and then also the bread, the challah, matzah, whatever it might be and say, well, wait a second, you're doing a communion type of thing. Uh, you're doing a type of a Pesach type of thing. Yeah, it's really not. And what is really happening is that you're sanctifying Shabbat is really what, what's going on. Gotcha. So yes, it is a sanctification, but it's not us being sanctified again. It's actually what Shabbat is really all about is sanctifying the day. We, you know, get into a whole nother uh, gotcha. side trail here, but I think most people can understand that we we have six days of the week and then we have Shabbat, right? And we're uh, disconnecting to connect. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we always said it's going from the profane to the holy. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. So that's basically what you're saying with the first cup. It's going from the profane to the holy you, person, you, your life, your. Gotcha. Right. Okay. Now, um, so it, all of the, the covenants are, again, they're progressive in nature. And it, you must enter, uh, in order to become part of the bride, you must enter into the first three covenants before you can get to the fourth. And the, the names and the implications of each one are extremely important because the, the overriding uh, theme of the cups of wine, well, again, all relate to patriarchal covenants. I know this is a new concept for, um, almost everybody that's hearing this. But looking at the patriarchal covenants, there's a overriding theme of the type of covenant that it represents. So the, the first cup uh, is really, uh, again, it's the cup of sanctification, but it's actually the servant covenant. When we entering into covenant when we come to faith in the biblical yeshua we're actually entering into covenant to serve how many people are sitting and spectating 
versus how many people are serving and sowing. Now, I'm not coming after anybody. I'm just throwing stuff out. Right. And uh, as Johnny said many, many years ago, when he got OJ off, if it doesn't fit, you must have quit. Okay. So if it fits, it's for you. Okay. The, the second uh, cup, the, the second type of patriarchal covenant is one of friendship. We go from a servant to a friend of Hashem. That's not an automatic thing. We choose to enter into covenant to begin with. But how many have actually chosen to begin serving how many people i'll ask it differently how many people are still sitting and spectating coming to be served not looking to serve the whole different paradigm and let me share this is that when just like coming to a service expecting to receive under the ministry of the word if you go to service looking for ways to serve you're it will be a very different dynamic and i believe very very strongly that your life will change for the good mm -hmm. We're all called to be servants. What does he say? You know, how many different times do we read in the gospel? My good and faithful servant. How many of us could really say that we're a servant? How many of us can really say that we're a good servant? How many of us can really say that we've been a faithful servant? But how many can really say that we've been a good servant? and faithful servant key word in all is servant 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 interesting thing between servant and a similar word in hebrew is slave <laughs> right so you we we were once slave and this is what pesach's all about we were once slaves in egypt and now we're free men some of us are still being held in a physical bondage, but also in, more importantly, a spiritual bondage. Who the Son sets free is free indeed, but you have to come to Him His way. He is the way, He is the truth, He is the life. And no one, doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what background you come from. I don't care who your daddy or your mommy is. Makes no difference. Doesn't matter if you're a Jew or you're a Gentile. We all must come into covenant through Yeshua. There's no other way. There's no other way. I mean, and that example is just laid out from the first deliverance, right? Out of Mitzrayim, out of Egypt. Exactly. Unless unless you you know picked up your things and began to follow moshe you're going to stay in egypt and that's it and so you have to take that march all the way to sinai and then accept the covenant and then the the fulfillment is fulfilled you're in you're you're there you know that, that's exactly right so we start off with the the servant covenant which is the first cup the cup of sanctification oh. And then we progress into the second type of covenant, which is the cup of friendship. The second cup uh, would be the, the cup of a blessing. I'm talking in traditional terms now. And so should we choose to progress even further to the third type of cup? Now we have the cup of 
salvation or the cup of redemption, but the covenant that we enter into at that point in time would be the cup or would be the inheritance covenant. We've demonstrated, okay. So picture you're, uh, you're at a big table or you're in a big family and nobody, and a guest is coming. And, uh, you know, you have, you, nobody knows who this person is. And this person just knows one, knows the, the head of the house, and that's it. And, and knows the wife, and, and that's all he knows. And he's invited to dinner. And he walks up, uh, driving in his car, he walks up into this place and sees hundreds, literally hundreds, or maybe tens and 20 of people. 30, 40 people all around. And he doesn't know who anybody is except for the one that invited him and his wife. Now it comes time to sit down for dinner. With something like that, you then understand who is family and who are the hired help because the hired help are not sitting at the table the same thing same analogy with the covenant of inheritance the inheritance covenant we can attain it should we choose to enter deeper into a relationship with yeshua but if not, our choice. We might be okay just saying, you know what? I'm just, you know, I made it. This is where the one saved, always saved comes in. <laughs> well, um, I think it does say in Philippians to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So, um anyway so the, the the first cup uh equates to a servant or a blood covenant between the two families and the uh the cup was consumed almost as soon as the door was closed because here's what happened the prospective groom is coming with his father a knock on the door. On the other side, the father of the prospective bride is now peering through, turns to the daughter and says, Rebecca, Isaac is here. Should I open the door? Rebecca has already determined what the answer is going to be. He knows in her heart what the answer is. It was already a foregone conclusion what was going to happen but the father asked anyway if rebecca says yes he opens up the door the father of and well let's abraham and esau come in and now they meet laban and uh and rebecca Now I'm I'm making making things up here. If Rebecca says to her father, no, they're gonna stand knocking at the door. The door is not gonna open. What would happen? It's a very embarrassing situation. If you've ever been in a situation proposing to marriage and she says no. I don't know if you've ever been there. I, it's never happened to me. But I, I've seen, uh, I've heard, you know, accounts. Uh, a lot of people try to do it at sports events. And some of them don't turn out to be okay. 
But what would happen? The father and the prospective groom would come in. They meet the family. And as soon as the door would be closed, every member of the bride's family above the age of accountability would participate and agree to serve one another. Isn't that exactly what is supposed to happen when we come into the house of God through the blood covenant? When we come to faith in the biblical Yeshua. Amen. Okay. So sanctification is just setting apart ourselves for service. Just as he did, he sanctified Israel as a nation to himself. The two families were doing the same with respect to each other. In effect, they were making a sacred commitment to become one giant family, each person unilaterally serving all the new members. And now you can probably, in, in many cultures besides Jewish one, you can have an understanding as to why marriages are so strong in many, many different cultures because of the, the same dynamic that goes on. It's a very strong dynamic throughout Africa. It's a very, very strong dynamic in Uganda. Extremely strong. You are, uh, you, you've become part of the family immediately and what what's wild is for me is like you've got aunts and uncles and cousins and steps and this one and that one. Where are all of these people coming from? <laughs> well, it, it, I mean, it pictures for me standing at Mount Sinai and you've got a mixed multitude. You've got the 12 tribes and all of a sudden they become one family in one instant of the betrothal, right? That, that's where it leads up to, yeah. okay? And as you, on Friday night, pay particular attention as you're reading through the Haggadah, which you can take your Bible in and you can, it, it, the Haggadah is basically taking pieces uh, directly from Torah. Most of it is going to come from Parashah Beshalach, from uh, chapter 12 in Exodus, or actually uh bowen uh Vieira as well uh beshalak too and leading up to sinai as, as what we're entering into on friday night is we're going back to exodus 12 we're seeing how all of this started, but the four cups actually take its form from Exodus chapter six, verses six and seven. And the cup of Elijah, the fifth cup, takes its form from verse eight. So it's there, you know, we, we get, sometimes we get so wrapped up and said, so, well, the rabbis this and the rabbis that, and the Bible doesn't say this. This is all man-made tradition. Well, um, yes and no. <laughs> Typical Jewish answer, yes and no. It's no because you, you won't find many customs in the Bible, but it doesn't mean that there aren't customs that are part of the Bible. And everybody has customs in their own family. How many recipes that were passed down to you today as the great, 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 great grandchild of whoever it was that 
came up with the recipe. Okay, I mean, it's the same thing. So let's get away from when it, it you know, all of this that says, well, man-made, 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 man-made. Well, I understand what it's referring to, but don't take everything and lump it all together and say it's not in the Bible, therefore it's man-made, because let's, let's look at it from a balanced perspective. Where is using toilet paper in the Bible? It's not. That's a man-made tradition. Do you still go out outside of the camp uh, with a little crock pot and do your business in there? Of course not. Okay, so come on. Where does it say you fold your laundry? And how do you fold your laundry? Are you folding it this way or are you folding it that way? Guess what? How your wife got brought up is the tradition that's going to be in your house. Was that a man made tradition? So now I'm having fun here. I'm pointing out the ridiculousness of how taking some of these things that are always sick. You're on mute, Brother Mitch. And just the really the the folly of it. That's all. So the, well, bottom line, when you get down to the principal idea of how co covenants were done back then and so forth, the four steps um, line up with how they how they did things, right? So whether it became right. before or after, um, the bottom line is principles. They're there. They're all there in the Bible. The principles are there in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Yep. They're all. That's exactly right. And so. What, ha what occurs is basic principles are lifted up and then th there's nothing wrong with doing that. Uh, that's basically what hermeneutics is all about. Okay. I mean, I okay. get, I get brother Mitch that. So, I mean, really historically, historically, the new covenant scriptures are the very first actually written down uh, elements of a Seder we have in history, like written down record of, uh, you know, uh, the Jewish people doing it. We, it's literally, you got to go to the new covenant scriptures to get, to get that. Um, and then from there we can, you know, you get Talmudic writings and so forth. Um, and it is because the Jewish people of the first century believers continued to follow the ways of Yeshua that, the, you know, obviously the non-believers in Yeshua, the rabbis are separating themselves from believers and so forth, but everyone's doing Seder meals at that time. And so um, there's a lot that they're saying, this means Yeshua, this means Yeshua. And I'm obviously the rabbis that didn't believe they're going, no, no, you know, this is what it means to us, you know? So there's definitely some things going on there uh, that are going on. But when I see the principles of everything, it's right there in the Bible. You know, so it, exactly, exactly. So that's that's the first cup. So uh, grasp uh, the first cup, if, if you can, with the principle of sanctification, uh, the overall us being set apart, but set apart for what? And the setting apart for the what is the principle really behind the first cup which is for service, service for us to become a servant so that we are serving others. When we're serving others, we become no longer selfish, but we become selfless, just like Yeshua, who was always selfless. And what's that prayer of uh, Yohanan the Immersa, that I pray that um, I decrease, that he would increase. That, that's a, a great prayer for everybody to take hold of. Well, sure. And Yeshua did it by washing the disciples' feet, 
too, right? Greatest exactly. example. Mm -hmm. yep. yep. And, uh, you know, it's, I, I remember uh, in a, a small group that I led many, many, many years ago, um, it, we were coming up to uh, Pesach um, and I just thought it would be a great idea uh, for me being the leader uh, to wash people's feet. So um, I, I asked as we were getting ready to start, is there uh, like a basin of water and I'm getting looked at kind of cockeyed by the host or actually mm -hmm. the hostess. And I said, maybe uh, there, maybe you can bring a towel or, uh, you know, hand cloth or something. And she just did because I asked. And then what, what I said was, okay, um, coming up to a, a very holy time of year now i'm in the church at this time okay and so what would i want to do if you would allow me the blessing if you would allow me the honor if you would humble yourself to do it is i would like to wash your feet and There were a, a, a lot of women there that didn't want to take off their shoes. <laughs> and I, I, all I said was, it's a personal choice. You know, if you want to, that's great. If you don't want to, that's okay too. And then, you know, what ended up happening is as I went around the room and, you know, a lot of people didn't take off their shoes and men too. Then after everybody saw what I was actually doing, Everybody wanted part of it. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's like, oh, that wasn't so bad. He's really he's not going to tickle my feet. He's not going to really take some soap and clean my toes and wash my toenails. <laughs> right. I'm not getting a pedicure. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but I, I remember that. So that's the first cup. And, um, so something to uh, just think of from a general perspective. So Passover, it, it's a betrothal ceremony divided by four cups of wine. And the cups of wine are referred to in ancient times or a covenant was referred to in ancient times as the blood of the grape. And the, the cups have been referred to since ancient times as the blood of the covenant. And again, as I said earlier, each cup represents a covenant relationship or a different type of relationship, a deeper relationship that we can have that the groom wants to have with us individually. But each covenant represents a deepening of that relationship. So as part of uh, the Seder on Friday night, the first cup of one is the cup of sanctification. And what are, what are we doing? We're saying yes to his proposal. Think with me. The prospective groom comes with his father knocking on the door. The prospective bride has the choice of opening up the door or not. Yeshua stands from the moment that we were born, knocking at the door of our heart, waiting patiently. And for me, he knocked and knocked and knocked and knocked for 40 years four months and one day until wax came out of my ears and I actually heard the knocking at the door of my heart and I opened up the door and I allowed him to come in. Now that's Revelation 3.20. That's as simplistic as it gets. That's the beginning of salvation. When we come into covenant, with the biblical Yeshua. I keep saying the biblical Yeshua because 
Yeshua is not just a man, as some think. You can't have redemption in just a man. You can't have salvation in just a man. It, you, you can't. You can think you do. And sadly, many people will continue believing that. And there will be a day when we are all going to appear before Yeshua. And for some of us who think that we're okay because I'm good, because I'm born a Jew, or I'm good because I do this, or I'm good because I became a Noahide, or I'm good because I, whatever it might be. He's going to say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Very sad, very truthful, but our choice. Uh, just, so you know, for me, I mean, the biblical Yeshua, it's, it's to begin to go south and teach that he's just a man. You're stepping into another gospel. You're stepping into a gospel that says a man can save you. And so I think that's a huge warning. I mean, there's when Paul talked about, you know, if anyone comes to you with another gospel other than the one I've given you, there's a lot of uh, interpretations there. Number one, not adding to the work of Yeshua. Number two, you got to recognize who he really is. Who is he? You know what I mean? Those are the two basic things I see in Galatians that you, you have to uh, really grasp right? Uh, you know, we can't add anything and we have to recognize who he really is. Mm -hmm. And so those that didn't recognize him for that term son of God, which was a messianic term, a deity term, they didn't, they, they didn't come along. They, they were disciples that, you know, abandoned him or turned or he just rejected. So that's right. So let, let, let's stay on that point for a moment, Tony. So there, during the intercovenantal period, there was this messianic expectation that grew uh, larger and larger and larger as the, the countdown of the years from BC would then become AD or BCE. BC to BCE, however, which way you want them. But the messianic expectation was simply this that whoever the Messiah would be, whatever his name would be, he would come as God in the form of a man. That's the messianic expectation. That's what, that is why son of God, son of man, all of these titles are all interwoven as part of the, the reality, the manifestation of the messianic expectation in the person of Yeshua. So, so cup number two. So the second cup was called the, the cup of bargaining. Now, um, and it represented, it was represented by the, the salt covenant or friendship. Now this cup was consumed by the bride and the groom and their two fathers only. So the first cup was consumed by everybody over the age of accountability. The second cup is only consumed by the bride and her father and the groom and his father and that's it okay they were covenanting together to become eternal friends with their joint son and daughter and with each other so this is why again we go back we said in the first cup this is why in many cultures 
as an, an Orthodox uh, Jewish family have very, very deep, strong marriages and family ties. And father-in-law and father-in-law and uh, mother-in-law and mother-in-law become friends. I mean, like, how would we say it? Uh, drinking buddies. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, to my mind. Okay. So th we're, we're, we're talking about, you know, bona fide friendship. This is what happens in Uganda. Now, I, I didn't have family representing me, but I had people who knew me, but also who knew my wife and represented me to my, or presented me to my wife's family. Going through, uh, just totally amazing with a basic understanding of covenant and basic understanding of the, 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 uh, the whole process of a Jewish wedding, starting with betrothal, et cetera, and paying the bride price. And now I'm actually in it, in a foreign country, having it right before my very eyes by people who are performing or going through some things that are, wait a second. You, you, you don't keep Shabbat, no, no issue. You don't know much about Torah. You don't know about the Moedim and uh, so forth. So, but why are you doing all of these Jewish things? Aha. And then I find out that there is a large population throughout all of Africa that are part of a broad group of people called the Bantu. And the Bantu people can be traced all the way back to the ancient Israelites. And you say that there are traditions and they're man-made. Yes, there are some, but you know what? There is in every culture, there are things that are being done that have its root right from the Bible. And I'm seeing this whole covenant process being played out right before my very eyes. And every year when we go through and we do it twice a year, we read through Shemot, we read through Exodus. And here we are with Pesach. And again, uh, the majority of the Haggadah is gonna come right from uh, 12, 13, 14, 15 in Exodus with uh, chapter six and we go through the plagues as well. Here we are again. And I, I, I just relive it in my mind. But specifically, when we're teaching, what we should always attempt to do is to place ourselves in the Bible. So as you're going through your Seder on Friday night, there, you're, you're going to hear a lot of literature. Don't throw it out. Don't boring. But a lot of it is boring, but it's biblical. Come with eyes open, with ears open, with a heart prepared to receive. And trust me, if, especially if this is your first time around, or even a second, third, but even if you've been doing it your whole life, you're always got, you should always come away with something new. But the principle, place yourself as if you were a slave, a physical slave, a spiritual slave in Egypt. And it will take on completely different meaning. And as you walk through the Seder, and when we get to the third cup in, in, a, in a little while, you'll see how it, wow, you'll see how it all fits together when you 
take basic Exodus 12, and then on top of that, lay over the gospel accounts, and then you'll see the connection. I had somebody ask me, sent me something about Good Friday the other day. And as you said, Tony, when we started, um, I asked them, so where's that in the Bible? And I don't know what kind of responses you get, but to that I typically get, well, you don't you don't know anything about Jesus? So my response to him is, when was the last time, if at all, you read Exodus 12 and laid the gospel accounts over that? And I said, if you do that, you'll see the connection. And then you'll see exactly what this time of year is all about it's not about a good friday or an easter sunday it's about the execution of messiah our pesach offered for us for he who knew no sin became the sin offering for us that we might become reconciled to God the Father in him and through him. So the second cup again, it's the, the cup of bargaining. So now what do we have here? We're bargaining. Just think. How many Jewish people do you know <laughs> that, that are not going to fight over a price or something? Okay. <laughs> so th this is where, sadly, this is where the term comes. Oh, he's trying to Jew me down. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, it, it, any, every part of culture, you go to a marketplace in Africa. It, it, wherever it doesn't matter where in every part of the world whatever the marketplace might be whatever country you're gonna go uh you have the vendor selling the whatever they're selling they're asking for a price you're gonna say no what are you doing you're gonna enter into bargaining this is what the second cup is all about but what are they bargaining what are what are they trying to come to terms with well when you're in the marketplace you're trying to you know you want to buy something, but you want to get it at a good deal, right? Of course, such a deal. Here, you're not trying to, to get the, well, you, if you're the father of the bride, you want to get a good deal for your daughter. That's your daughter, okay? She's not getting away cheap. She's going to be expensive. Now, just think with me. And, and this happens today as well. In ancient times, almost every single daughter who was going to be married was a virgin. She was a prized possession. Or that would be one of the reasons, not the reason, but one of the many different reasons. In many cultures today, the bride price goes up, 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 up for a virgin daughter. It does. The father knows he's given away something really special. So now what, what are the families going to be bargaining over? What are they going to be haggling over? They're going to be haggling, bargaining over the terms of the covenant. What are the terms of the covenant? The ketubah. Where do we find the terms of the covenant in the Torah? Ah. Parashah Mishpatim, judgments. Chapter 21 through 23, it goes through uh, 21 through 24, but uh, physically, we have the actual ketubah 
which is referred to commonly as the Ten Commandments or the Ten Commands. They're really the Ten Words. And we find them in Exodus uh, 20 from verse 1 down to 17 or 18, maybe maybe 19. But the, uh, that's the summarization. But then we have the terms, the elongation of what the actual terms of the covenant were. And here, with the cup of bargaining, the families, uh, the, the two fathers are basically now going to haggle over. What are the terms of the covenant? So, and this is usually where, during this whole marriage process, that negotiations were would break down if they were ever going to. But and if they manage to overcome the giving and the getting, and I want this, and no, I can only do this, and what about this, and what about that, all of the different terms of the covenant it's a get when you're negotiating with somebody no matter what it is especially when you're in sales it's going to be a given again because if you're the guy that's selling something and you know you have a, a really good prospect that's highly qualified there's going to be something that you're going to have to negotiate on Maybe it will be the terms of the actual service contract. Maybe you'll have to add a little bit more to the plain uh, piece of equipment that they were just going to get for twenty-five thousand. It does. It's not always and only about the price. There's a lot of other things that can be bought bargained with and bargained for. So, but if they manage, if the families manage to overcome all of the difficulties, they entered into a friendship covenant. And then in a, a similar fashion, we're admonished to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, Philippians 2, 12, okay? So when we accept Yeshua knocking at the door of our heart, we open up the door, we enter into the servant covenant. It then over time will mature if we allow it to, if we choose to mature growing in grace and knowledge of Yeshua, it will mature into friendship. How many of us can really say that we are in fact a friend of God? I know that there was that song that came out um, years ago. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. That's all that I remember of it right now. But, so, Brother Mitch, in ancient uh, culture, then uh, the coming together, the betrothal would begin, uh, obviously, from a legal standpoint, they're married. And then over the course of from now until the ceremony, they're learning how to become friends, right? The couple to be is building the relationship, uh, friendship uh, to build up to the consummation point of the marriage. Is that a good way of seeing it? Yeah. Uh, that, that's a good way. Uh huh. So, um, you know, uh, what, what's going on here is that the families are, uh, you know, they're, they're being really direct. Okay. Um, a, a lot of people today are really direct. Uh, more so, uh, certain cultures are very direct. <laughs> and, you know, how much would the groom's family contribute to the wedding feast? Where would they hold it? What skills uh, do, does the bride need to acquire to become uh, a Proverbs 31 wife? Um, okay. What possessions would she bring with her? 
did she fully understand her responsibilities to remain pure? The bride's family would also want to know how the groom intended to support her. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just as it was the bride's primary responsibility to purify and prepare herself. The groom's chief responsibility was to go away and to prepare a place for her to live. Anybody home? What did Yeshua say? Okay, this, this is, you can perhaps, as we just touch a little upon the cups, and we've only gotten a little bit through, or maybe about halfway through cup two, you can start to see how these are all part of the Bible. And now, with a basic understanding of the cups at Pesach, you can see how it's all weaved together, that it's all part of marriage and the greatest love story that was ever written and ever told. So, So the third cup. So the the third cup was a cup of cup of redemption, or the cup of inheritance, which represented a sandal covenant and signified the shared inheritance of the marriage partner. The cup was drunk at the end of the meal. So let's recap a little bit here. Knocking on the door, father of the bride opens up. They have a cup of sanctification that all family members above the age of accountability participate. Now, okay, they, they're agreeing, we're gonna serve one another. How are we gonna serve one another? Now we're gonna bargain about how we're gonna do that, but primarily we're bargaining over what the groom's responsibilities are going to be and what the bride's responsibilities are going to be, the terms of the covenant. And now with the third cup. And, and so the second cup was drank by, I drank drunk uh, by the bride and her father and the groom and his father. Just those four. This is before the meal. Now, after the meal, we have the third cup. Uh huh. The bride and the groom only to symbolize their exclusive commitment to each other, along with their increasing level of intimacy. And I, I have to tell you that the, the first time that I really started to get deeper than just things that I knew from being a Jew my whole life, uh, but then also uh, when I came to salvation and then the next, which was 93 in July, and then the next year, uh, Pesach was uh, in forget if it was late March or early April or, or whenever it was in 94, I started to get into some other things and started to realize, wow, look at, look at how all of this ties to Yeshua. This, this is amazing. And the third cup, every Jew knows this. What are you doing? You're, you're lifting up the cup of redemption. But the redemption that we're thinking of as a Jew is the future redemption when Messiah is going to come. Now think with me on that point. When did the redemption start? It's kind of a trick question because most people will say 
it started with Yeshua. Yes, it did. But the question really is, when did it start with Yeshua? And almost everybody will say it started when he hung on the stake, when he hung on the tree. Wrong. <laughs> it started way back in the garden. It really did. I will, I will maybe get into that a little bit deeper. Um, but basically, the third cup officially sealed the marriage agreement between them. Once the bargaining was over, the families brought in a scribe who wrote out all of the terms of the marriage covenant into a formal agreement known as the ketubah. So you know, it was almost boilerplate, you know, kind of like what legal documents are today. And then what do you do? You just tailor it to suit the specific need. But from that point forward, if one, if either the bride or the groom died, the survivor would fully inherit the deceased partner's possession. Inheritance covenant, the cup of inheritance, the cup of redemption or the cup of salvation. I think at, with that, it becomes a little bit stronger and a little bit more meaningful than just that. Eh, I'm going to pick up another cup of wine. <clears throat> so the third cup, now I'm going to bring this into Yeshua and the gospel account. The, the third cup corresponds to the cup Yeshua shared during the Seder, during the Passover, or what's commonly referred to as the Last Supper. Some people would make a better connection using that term than saying it differently. But when he washed their feet, and what did he do? He transferred his inheritance to them through the sandal cover. He also made further references to his coming marriage. He was called out once knowing that it was customary, customary for the groom not to drink wine again until when the wedding ceremony. And this explains, you think about it, this explains why he said he wouldn't touch the fruit of the vine again until he would do so with them in the kingdom of heaven. Where, when, where, what will happen then? Marriage supper of the Lamb. So definitely so, on one hand, the Passock is not fully complete yet. Correct. It's begun, but the uh, consummation, of course, has not happened yet. Yeah. So there's the historical, which is the coming out of Egypt. There is the Lord's Pesach. That's all part of it. There is the biblical, which Yeshua participated. There is the practical, which is what we do every year, what a memorial, if you will. And then there is the prophetic, which is yet to come, but will occur. So it, what, I, what I try to do on the fly is to put into uh, practice alliteration. I, I kind of messed up a little bit. But you get the drift. Right. Amen. Okay. Now, many people at this point will say, aha, this is communion. And I say, aha, wrong. But not so much wrong. Yes, what you're doing, you're calling communion. Yes, the biblical term of communion really means to fellowship together. And if you've gone into covenant 
with the biblical Yeshua, cup one, you become a servant. You're serving him or you're serving others through him. You're now a servant of the kingdom in him. You've gone into a deeper level of covenant with the second cup, the cup of bargaining. You've now entered into a friendship covenant. And now here with the third cup, you're taking it, you're purposely, intentionally taking it a step further into the third cup. And you're saying that I, I'm, I'm going to receive an inheritance. You're not looking to receive an inheritance, but part of it is that what are you going to inherit? If you continue on, you have placed yourself in a position to inherit, inherit a place as part of the bride. But I'm thinking of that, he says that, uh, Shaul does, that all of our riches are stored in the heavenly. That's where our inheritance is. So communion, as some refer to it, it's in essence a form of reaffirming status as a commitment not to be the bride. Well, actually not, not, not a commitment that you are the bride but it's a recommitment or a commitment to become part of the bride. Very different in how I said it. You haven't become part of the bride yet. You're making a commitment to be part of the bride. Every step, every cup, every one of these covenants is a deeper step into a deepening relationship with him. And I think it's uh, important when you do a study on communion, you understand that the first thing that they have to do in order to begin to call it communion is you have to break away from Pesach. You have to now begin to break away from it and create this other thing where you're going to just celebrate the resurrection of Yeshua. Now you're taking that one event there you're isolating it from the feast and you're moving it out of its context and building a whole new context around it. And the context that you're building is, oh, let's go back to John six. And he said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can have no part of me. So now we got to begin to develop this doctrine here and we got to make it like every time you have a service, you got to be having this because Unless you continually eat his flesh, drink his blood, you have no part of him. It becomes a salvation issue. It becomes, hey, unless you do this continually, you can't remain in the kingdom because he says you can have no part of me. And so you, you're just ripping it out of context, building this whole thing. We got to give it another name because we can't call it Pesach. We can't call it, you know, for what it is. We're going to, it's communion. It's communion. And that's where we're developing this term around this man-made doctrine but not only that and you just hit on um, what i was going to say what you've now done is you've created established participated and perpetuated traditions of men and many don't understand that's exactly what they're doing but then they would say well look at you your traditions of men because you follow Torah. Your traditions of men because you follow Hanukkah, Purim, Unleavened Bread, overall Passover, Shavuot. Your traditions of men, where is this? What is this? Because you've divorced yourself from the Jewishness of Scripture. Sadly. So, well, 
lost my thought here. So we are on the third cup. Uh, you went through and explained how, um, you know, it is, uh, well, you moved off to communion on how they got, you know, involved in communion. Uh, you, you, you talked about the blending of it together as a community um, yeah. coming together. Okay. So, uh, you know, the, the commitment that we uh, make to become part of Yeshua's bride, this is, you know, really always true at weddings. It's always true at Passover. And these are the, the parallel celebration that Hashem is uh, appearing to emphasize, but then re-emphasizing the sanctity and also the intimacy of both our earthly unions, not only with each other, but with our heavenly union with him and in him. So let's see. All right, well, we'll, we'll jump to uh, the fourth cup. So the fourth cup is, or was known as the cup of praise. And it's shared between the, uh, the bride and the groom only, but only during the wedding ceremony itself. The fourth cup awaits all who are chosen to be the bride by Yeshua. And it will be taken on the wedding day and it will forever seal Yeshua's union with his beloved bride, which is not the church, but his beloved bride, which of all of those that who have become part of the Israel of God, as it says in Galatians, or the Commonwealth of Israel, as it says in Ephesians. And I can go to many other different places. So this is not something that you're born into. This is something that you determine that you want a part of. So we become eligible for the fourth cup only after we've met all of the previous requirements for entering into the first three. The decisions to do so, they're ours alone and only ours. It doesn't matter what anybody else in our family did. It's our personal decision to say it differently. As many people have heard probably many, many, many times in the kingdom, there are no grandchildren. We're all children. Yeah. So Yeshua chooses his own bride to whom he promised the, the crown of life. Revelation 2.10. Okay. So do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, Satan is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful in until death and I will give you the crown of life. So again, this is why Yeshua says in Matthew twenty two fourteen, 14, for many are called and few are chosen. So he says, uh, I go to prepare a place. And to continue the sequence of the betrothal event, uh, by the time that the, the happy couple uh, had drunk the third cup of wine, there's only three more milestones rem remain. The first one is, now the bride price has to be paid. Okay. Um, what's the amount? What's going to be? Now, we, we find that it was in the Bible, we, we see that 
30 pieces of silver. It was 100% refundable if the bride turned out to be impure. The second was now the groom had sole responsibility to go and prepare a home. He would live with his bride, which would often be, but not necessarily, but would often be an extension on the home of his own father. The building and the furnishing process itself take a year or more during which the bride and the groom had very little direct contact with each other. This is where it gets to be, you know, more personal for me. It's like, he's over there, I'm over here. <laughs> but we, you know, we talk, but we're, we're not together. So the groom was under an ironclad rule of his father who was the only person empowered to judge when the groom's bridal preparations per the ketubah were sufficient and completed. And in Mark 13, 32, Yeshua says, but of the day and of the hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son of man, but the father alone, referring to when he is returning. We know the season, we don't know the day. Third, as the groom finalized his preparations, he would let word slip out that the wedding day was, was near. And meanwhile, the bride's family and friends would start preparing for a feast. And the bride and the bridemaids would buy enough oil to keep their lamps lit for at least two weeks. And now people are flashing forward into the parable of the virgin. And that's good. The bridesmaid's job was to watch for the groom's arrival. When they saw him coming for his bride, their lamps would show the way. They were also expected to warn the bride, but a very small but important function that they had. And we see this in Matthew 25, 1 through 13. The groom could come anytime between 6 p.m. and midnight and on the second and fourth day of the week. When he did so, he had to see the bride's welcoming light in her window. If she let it burn out, he would take that as a sign that he, she changed, she either changed her mind or simply didn't care anymore. And he would turn away and leave her in darkness. When the groom arrived later in the evening, he would be accomplished, uh, accompanied by a crowd of groomsmen, all of which he would have uh, selected well in advance, usually while building the residence for the bride. Uh, all were males, all were virgins, and all would have a close relationship with him. It was their job to guard him and to announce his coming by the blowing of shofars. As I'm, you know, I'm reading through this again, I'm sharing this with you, I get more and more excited because I know what I am about to go through on a, per a very personal level. But also, I see so much connected to the gospel. And, and I hope that you are as well as I'm sharing this because this is not made up stuff. It doesn't say this is what they're going to do in the biblical accounts. But what we see in the biblical accounts is the manifestation of the explanation. 
So Brother Mitch, what source would you recommend then? What source are you using for others, uh, you know, for the explaining that you're doing? Well, there, there's a lot of uh, different good ones. Um, oh boy, oh boy. Uh, gotta be careful um, because there, there's a lot of material that's out there. And if you just stay with one particular source, eventually you'll come across something that you're going to know if you've sure. been, you know, uh, if you have a, uh, I don't know how to say it, level of maturity, then you're going to know that that's just not right. So what I always do or attempt to do is to take a lot of different sources, put them all together, and then uh, kind of like do a major edit. And then just, just piece it together that way. And I have found over the course of time that that's a, for me, it's a very safe way. It, it turns out to be a very solid way and a very balanced way as well. Mm -hmm. So um, if I was to, uh, to, to provide um, anybody with one source, I would really uh, providing a disservice to everybody. So let's see. Okay. Well, uh, okay. So before dawn, now we've, we've gone through the night and we know that there's going to be a wedding because the light is still on. She's waiting. She has enough oil. She's not in darkness. This is the parable of the virgin. But a few hours before dawn, the groom and his men would leave the bride and her bridesmaids. Her friends would lead her to the mikvah, the baptismal pool, if you will, where um, she would perform uh, what's actually biblically called kavila or immersion, where she would be bathed in living water, mayim hayim. And here is the proper way of performing tevila or immersion or baptism. And there's many different baptisms. And that's why you see it in Hebrews 6, 2. It says that we will leave the doctrine of baptisms, plural. But anyway, you would uh, bow or stoop down towards the oncoming water. This is the, it's an act of love, but you're demonstrating by dunking yourself, by stooping or bowing yourself seven times, that you're now understanding that A, that Hashem, God is the source of all life and you are in submission to him. So with all of these cups, there's also a, uh, an immersion that's being performed. So after this, they go to the chuppah. And now the groom is going to be wearing a, uh, a wreath of fresh myrtle and roses. Thorns were also included, a symbol that their love would bring them both joy and pain. The, the, uh, did you see the picture? What does Yeshua end up having on his head? 
He's got a wreath, if you will. And he's got thorns in it. And he's not only being bled out by being bitten, uh, by being beaten, but he's also bleeding from the head because the thorns So there, there's a lot more uh, that I can go into. Um, I think it's a good time or a good place to stop with that and then go back into maybe a little bit more of the Haggadah. Now, there's thousands and thousands of different Haggadahs. It, it's like how many different Bible versions are there? So, and what do you do with a Bible version? You pick the one that you like the best and you stay with that. And that's pretty much what happens with the Haggadah. Now, what you could do, what a lot of people do with Bibles, they, they get a lot of Bibles or have different versions or translations of the Bible available to them. And then you can refer to them, you know, to see what this one says and that one says and get a deeper meaning. You can do the same thing with a Haggadah. There's no right or wrong Haggadah. It doesn't have to be published by JPS. It doesn't have to come uh, from Chabad. It can be a Messianic Haggadah. And there are many numerous Messianic Haggadahs. In years times uh, gone by, I produced one, uh, sadly, many years ago, uh, when I was having my then computer fixed, um the guy blew out my my hard drive and everything went bye-bye wow. and that Haggadah went went along with it as well so it's up there somewhere <laughs> <laughs> no i i really appreciate you uh going through this uh brother mitch because i personally never heard you walk through it i hadn't had time to uh hear some of your past uh teachings where you walked through it so um definitely uh uh thank you for you know kind of walking through this and so forth and uh, and explaining so let, let me uh, go to the uh you know the major part of uh the, the seder uh, and that is when we get to uh at the beginning of the seder uh shortly after the first cup is uh, bless the cup of sanctification. Uh, what's going to happen is the leader will take, uh, there's three pieces of matzah in uh, what's called a matzah tash. He'll take from the, the middle portion, he'll break it, put a piece back in, but then with the piece that is broken off, he's then going to wrap it in... Um, white linen and in, in some form of a white cloth, paper towel, towel, toilet paper, something that's white. I mean, I, I've seen it done where lack of anything, it's just white paper, it doesn't matter. And then it's hidden away. Gonna go find it, the children will, later that evening. It has so much So much meaning to it. But we're, so what are we looking for? We're looking for the afikomen. We're not hunting for an Easter egg. Okay. That's number one. The afikomen represents Yeshua. The, the rabbis attempt in numerous ways to explain away what the afikomen really means which has been historically traced back to messianic believers and either in the first or the second century, I believe first century, uh, with probably, um, I, I don't know exactly how or at what time the Afikomen 
actually became part of the traditional Seder, but we have it. And it's not something that's made up brand new yesterday. It's been around for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And this is part of the Seder with the Afikoman, the breaking of the third matzah, wrapping it up and hitting it, hiding it away so that the children can come and uh, seek it out, find it later in the night has been going on. It's a, it's something that happens in almost every Jewish home, but it will happen on Friday night in every Jewish home that is hosting a Seder. Whether they recognize what it represents or not, it will occur. Yeah, for those of you listening, um, the first reference we have of the Afi Coleman is from Melito, the Bishop Melito of Sardis, of one of the seven assemblies there in Asia Minor. He was a Jewish Christian, and we have it in one of his sermons in around 170 CE. It's the very first mention, and he is using it in line with Yeshua. And so uh, definitely we do believe that it was already a tradition uh, done by believers, um, and we have it right here in the second century being done. And so... The afikomen is a Greek word. It's not Hebrew. It's not Aramaic. It's Greek. And it comes from the verb form of he is coming. He is coming. So you can see there a lot of connections. So, uh, you know, uh, rabbis have over the course of time attempted to explain it away that the three matzahs represent um, Cohen's, the Levites, and the rest of Israel. Those would be the three distinct, uh, different types of people made up of Israel. The Kohen is, uh, the, the, from the, you can only be a high priest if you were from uh, Levite or Le Levi, but you could only, or from Aaron, but you could only be a high priest if you were from one of Aaron's sons, okay? So now you could have the Levites, which would be all of the other Levites who were not part of the Cohens. And then you would have not everybody who's part of Israel is actually a Levite. So you have, obviously, there's 11 other tribes. So those, those are the three. So if that's the case, the question is, well, why then is the middle matzah broken, wrapped up and hidden away? And then some would say, well, it represents the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the same question. Well, if that is the case, then why is the middle matzah broken, wrapped up, and hidden away? Okay, makes no sense. The only sense that one could come away with is that it does represent Yeshua. And we see that the Afikomen is the last part of the Seder that is actually eaten. And from there, the rabbis have taken away from the actual meaning and said, well, you know what? Since it's the last part that we eat at the Seder, it represents dessert. But if you dig deep, if you choose to do it, you will find in a uh, very, and I did this many, many years ago, so I don't recall the actual source, but I do know with 100% certainty that the Afi Coleman is referred to as the Zarar Adonai, the arm of the Lord. Arm of the Lord happens to be a rabbinic term. Now, arm of the Lord is found numerous times in Isaiah. There's no question about that. But arm of the Lord is a rabbinic term, Zarar Adonai, that represents Messiah. Now, 
Let's go back to Isaiah 53, verse one. Whose report shall we believe? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? When you hold up the matzah, and I strongly encourage everybody to do so, if you hold up the matzah, you'll see that it's pierced. It has little holes in it. Yeshua was pierced. You'll see that the matzah is bruised. It has little uh, crunch marks in it. Yeshua was bruised. You'll see that it is striped. Yeshua was striped by receiving lashes. And more importantly, by his stripes, we are healed. It's flat because it doesn't have any levity. And just like Yeshua, he had no sin. And as I said before, he who knew no, knew no sin, became the sin offering for us that we might be reconciled to God in him and through him. So what's also interesting is that the, the matzah is wrapped up in something that's white, representing Yeshua's body that was uh, wrapped for burial. And it's hidden away. Now the child, the, the children go searching around. And normally uh, there's a gift that one of the children would receive, he who finds it. But what does that represent? We, we've just connected the Afi Coleman to Messiah Yeshua. The children are going, they're looking for the afikoman. The children are going in what? Childlike faith. Looking for the afikoman. And what does he himself say? That we should be like little children. And if we would come to him as little children, so many of these disputes that go on, that will occur in the future, and are actually happening right now to some of you and some of us. If we would all do that, and more importantly, if we would follow his rules to resolve conflict that are gonna happen from time to time because we're all people. And from time to time, we rub people the wrong way. We're not understood. Uh, nobody asks follow-up questions. People get offended so easily. People get hurt. People become annoyed, whatever it might be. Take the step, take the high road. It matters not who's wrong. It matters not who's right. Take the high road, take the first step, make the attempt to A, ask for forgiveness. Because when you read the gospel in Matthew, it doesn't matter who. It says, drop your gift and go. And then second, attempt, you be the one, be the agent of the ministry that we already have, and that is the Ministry of Reconciliation. Attempt to reconcile. Reconciliation can only occur if there's first forgiveness. There can only be forgiveness if there's two party agreeing to forgive one another, or the offer and the acceptance thereof. If you've offered, that's all you can do. You cannot make somebody accept your offer of forgiveness. If they have truly 
accepted your offer of forgiveness, then you can at least then begin to reconcile a relationship. And prayerfully, that reconciliation, which begins with the forgiveness, can lead to restoration. But again, the fact that one asks for forgiveness and receives it doesn't mean there's going to be a reconciliation. The fact that there was, in fact, forgiveness offered and accepted, and there may have actually been reconciliation of the parties, doesn't mean that the relationship will be restored. And the classic example is Jacob and Esau. And what do we see? We see they went their separate ways, but they were, in fact, reconciled. They did, in fact, forgive one another. They were reconciled, but their relationship was not restored. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. Absolutely. Yep. But it is our prerogative take the high road get off your high horse it doesn't matter if you're wrong and it certainly doesn't matter if you're right when you know that somebody your brother or sister has something against you or when you know that you've actually wronged your brother or your sister you be the one to take the first step you be the one to take the high road. That's all you can do. The rest is up to them. And that's that's important for all of us as we're approaching Pesach. Um, Paul makes it very clear, taking the cup, taking the bread in an unworthy manner can bring judgment upon yourself. And so we all have to reflect uh, when coming to that Seder table, coming together, take the time right now in the next couple of days or so and uh, leave your gift at the altar right now and uh, begin to examine yourself and, and do exactly the steps that Brother Mitch said. Be the first to go and make the effort. Uh, whether the person does so or not, that's up to them, but you can walk away stating uh, that the, the door is open. You know, it's open. So, so yeah. the, the other thing that I would like to bring out and this is something that is uh, not usually done, is when we come to the third cup, the, the cup of redemption, you know, we say the blessing, Baruch Atah Adonai, Elokeinu Melech Alam, Borei Puri HaGopen, that's fine, but there's something more biblical. I mean, that's a prayer. That prayer itself is, you won't find that prayer in the Bible. But what you will find in the Bible is Psalm 116, 12, followed up by the very next verse, which would be verse 13. And here's what 12 says. How shall I render to the Lord all the benefits given to me? And here's, that's the answer, or rather that's the question. The answer is found in verse 13. I will lift up the cups plural of salvation the cups of deliverance relates back to exodus 6 verses 6 and 7 these are the four steps in the wedding or the marriage process these are the four cups of wine at the seder these are the four different patriarchal covenants these are the covenants that we can choose to enter into, and they're available to whosoever will. But when we lift up the cups of salvation, the Hebrew word there is actually Yeshuot. It's the plural form of Yeshua. So think of it this way, and this is how I first came to understand it in 1994, many years ago. I'm reading along and I, I actually picked up a Haggadah or maybe it was an article on, actually, it's an article on Passover. 
and they were referring to cups of salvation. Now I knew cups of salvation goes back to Exodus six, six and seven. But what shocked me was the reference to Psalm 116, 12 and 13. And then when I got there, it blew my mind because at that point in time, I'm now having a basic understanding, even though I'm at that point, I'm maybe 10 months old in Yeshua, I'm still a baby, but I, I have this brain. I still have the ability to connect the dots because in the business world, I still had critical thinking and it wasn't so thinking critically in the right way because that's where I ended up in prison where I came to faith. But what I'm saying is this, I'm reading Psalm 116, 12, and it's like, okay, how do I render the benefits given unto the Lord? And I'm reading 13 and it says, I'll lift up the cup of salvation. And I said, wait a second. I think I know what that Hebrew word is, but I don't, I, I'm not 100% certain. So at the time I had, uh, yes, even in prison, we had some, uh, we had a library and some of us were uh, more endowed with uh, money in our uh, canteen fund. So we would be able to buy different things, et cetera. And I went to uh, one of my brothers, one of our brothers, and asked to look it up. And lo and behold, guess what that Hebrew word is? It's Yeshua. That's the form of it. So I'm now thinking, wait a second. Lift up the cup of redemption. That's the typical term that it's referred to. But redemption and salvation, it's not the same, but they're intermingled with one another redemption salvation salvation yeshua whoa i know yeshua is the hebrew word or the hebrew name translated into english anglicized if you will as jesus and this is i was absolutely mind-boggling moment it was one of those whoa so this is what I did in my mind. I'm lifting up the cup of redemption. I'm lifting up the cup of salvation. I'm lifting up the cup of Yeshua, but I'm lifting up the cup of Jesus and I'm calling upon the name of the Lord. Whoa, but why would you wanna call upon the name of the Lord? Here we go into Joel chapter two, verse 32, whoever, calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And this is where Shaul draws it from in the book of Romans in 11. And at that point in time, I'm like, I, again, I'm 10 months old in the faith. And I'm, <laughs> I'm a 45 year old man at that time. So I know about satyrs. But I've never heard this before. I've never seen this before. But now I'm a believer and my eyes are wide open. And you come to a Seder, whether it's your first time or your 100th time. Uh, this year will be my 69th time. Um, probably not at my very first one, although my actual biblical birthday was Nissan 14. So. I'll be celebrating my biblical birthday Friday night as well. Just amazing things that you see, amazing things that you can connect the dots with. And just like in the tabernacle, everything points to Yeshua. Amen. Everything. So I'm going to uh, probably on Sunday night, I'll uh, go into some of these things a little bit deeper and we'll um, very likely start teaching through in depth the individual cups, but then continue on 
into how they manifest itself. Because once you understand covenant is not a testament and understand that covenant doesn't end anything, but that continues to draw upon or build upon rather things that came before, that things just don't go away. When you have that basic understanding, now you can understand the difference between covenant, which is biblical, and testament, which is not. And very simply, testament is a Greek legal document, a Greek legal term, a Greek legal word between two parties that has a specific beginning and a specific end. A covenant, on the other hand, is an ongoing relationship between two parties. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Brother Mitch, uh, for taking the time to do this. Uh, I, I enjoyed kind of sitting back on this one and, and seeing your perspective and learning from it and uh, watching you put it all together. Um, definitely, uh, I think everyone will enjoy it and uh, it'll help make a lot of things, like you said, come together. Uh, it'll enrich your relationship with Yeshua and it will enrich your understanding of covenants. I mean, without understanding the covenant, how can you walk in a relationship with Yeshua? This should be one thing that should be taught over and over and over again. Uh, and so it's one of the big disconnects that is oftentimes, because we just look at Yeshua as our good buddy, saved by grace, you know, whatever we do, that's fine. He's got us in his hands, you know, and there's really not a constant understanding of covenant. So, and we see the... Uh, the fruit of that in uh, marriages today, right? Over 50% end in divorce. And uh, I know, um, you know, it's, it's a struggle for all of us, like understanding marriage, understanding covenant from a biblical perspective. It's only then that we can have a sound marriage, a sound relationship with Yeshua. And we actually will learn that uh, at the end of the marriage, when you're right before going to see the Lord, that you now love your wife more than you did on the day of the wedding. I mean, that's that's the goal, because the longer you are together, the more in love you should be. And that's the way our relationship with Yeshua should be also. Amen. So we will uh, be signing off here. We hope you guys have a great Chag uh, Sameach, everyone. Happy uh, feast day in Yeshua. And uh, we will see you on the other side. Next time we come together, we'll be in the midst of still the uh, seven days of unleavened bread, the seven days of matzah. And maybe we'll touch more on that. And we'll also be counting the days, right? Counting the days heading up to Shavuot. And I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about that next week too. So uh, again, hope you enjoyed. Thanks again, Brother Mitch. And uh, shalom, everyone. Shalom and Shavuot.